In this lecture, we're going to discuss some group theory, which uh, sounds very bizarre because this is a class in topology. The reason why we're going to discuss group theory and a very special type of group theory, it's called combinatorial group theory, we will explain what that means very soon, is because in topology courses, when one learns about the fundamental group, at some point, the combinatorial group theory just comes up in, in the course. And uh, if someone is not familiar with this topic, then there's a lot of confusion that gets introduced. So because of this, it makes a lot of sense to discuss this specialized area in group theory first. We'll actually have two classes. This class will talk about what combinatorial group theory is, and next lecture will focus on commutative groups and say uh, some stuff about them. And then together, those two lectures will help give a lot of insight to what's going to happen later on when we get to the fundamental group. At, at the present, it's not clear why we're suddenly talking about this. This is a deviation from topology. But you will appreciate it more once we get to the topology. And I've noticed that many books on topology or many courses on topology, uh, they do have a tendency to not say much about this stuff. And then when the calculations that involve the fundamental group come up, um, a lot of these facts are asserted and they're not explained and there's a lot of confusion that results from that. So we're going to talk about group theory. And uh, what's also interesting, this is not typically taught, typically taught in an algebra course. A graduate algebra course, there's like algebra one and then there's algebra two. So a graduate algebra course, often the way it goes, is going to depend on the university, but often in algebra one, you do group theory, you do group theory, and then maybe one does some ring theory, unit of rings. And then algebra two might consist of possibly maybe modules. Modules are a generalization of vector spaces. And then one can possibly move to uh, field theory that also includes Galois theory. So often, that is what Algebra 1, Algebra 2 is. So if someone takes a graduate course in Algebra, these are typically the topics that are being taught. Now, what I'm about to say is a little bit controversial, but I think there's way too much emphasis, way too much emphasis on group theory. And we end up learning topics in group theory that often do not come up again. So for example, we learn about the Silo theorems, which are very interesting, they're, they're a lot of fun, Silo theorems or Jordan-Holder theorem or nilpotent groups or things like that. And then we talk about commutator subgroups and all that stuff. And then um, when do we see it? Like we do not really see it that much. And the stuff which is more important, like the ring theory stuff is more important, the module stuffs are more important, like these are a lot more important. So I think field theory generally gets a good amount, a good, um, a good treatment in most algebra courses. But I think these two, uh, they're underemphasized. There's not enough emphasis on this, and there's way too much emphasis on group theory. And in a way, it kind of does make sense because out of all different algebraic structures that one can introduce, the structure of the group is the most elementary one because there's only a single structure to work with. And then once one defines a group, then one can start proving a lot of theorems about groups. And then it's quite natural for mathematicians to then just go overboard and prove way too many things on just one topic and take time away from the other topic. So like if I was organizing an algebra course, so this is like the controversial part, I would minimize the amount of group theory, focus more on these two. And I would also restructure group theory. I think that combinatorial group theory, it should be part of a group theory course that one sees in algebra. I think that th this stuff that we're about to talk about right now, especially if it's handled over um, a few classes more carefully with more examples will probably be beneficial to most uh, to most people, as opposed to something like the Silo theorems, for example. Obviously, if there's an infinite amount of time, one would learn everything. But uh, if you're trying to confine it to one year course, you have to make some kind of compromises about which things, you, which type of topics you think are more important. And I've just noticed from experience knowing combinatorial group theory in general, in general mathematics, 
is more beneficial than learn, knowing something about what a nilpotent group is, for example. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about combinatorial group theory because it's not typically that is that is taught, and it might if it comes up, it comes up in like an algebra course, it comes up in like a topology course, but then it does not get a good enough treatment. So let's say what this is. So before we do any of that, uh, I would like to use some motivation from linear algebra. So here's some motivation. Here's a, a motivating example from linear algebra. And let's recall what a basis is. So let us recall what a basis is for and we can talk about a basis of a vector space, but to keep it even simpler, let's just talk about Euclidean space. What is a basis for Rn? A basis. So a basis, it is a collection of vectors. Let's call it x1, x2, xn in Rn, so that if you pick any other vector in Rn. So the requirement for a basis is, in a linear algebra course, the way they probably teach you what a basis is, is they tell you that these vectors, they generate Rn, which means that every vector can be expressed as a combination of these. And that also, they are linearly independent. Uh, there is no way you can make these add up to zero unless you make the coefficients of all of them equal to zero. But equivalently, like you can also say so that if you pick something in Rn, you can express that vector using the basis vectors in a unique way. There's only one way to do it, a n x n, where these are real coefficients, so those are scalars, and there is a unique way to do this. There is a unique way. So that is what we call a basis. And uh, well, yeah, so that would be the definition of a basis. But there's another way to describe a basis through a mapping property. So here's an alternative way of describing a basis. An alternative way to describe a basis. So we'll say this. So we say, so we say that a collection of vectors x1 up to xn rn form a basis if and only if for any collection for any so let's call these target vectors. So for any target vectors, let's call them y1, y2, up to yn in some other Euclidean space. It could be of a different dimension. It does not matter. And by the way, it can happen that um, n is bigger than m. That's OK. So we just call these, so we're going to call these the target vectors. So, this, so these are the basis vectors, and these are the target vectors. So we say that um, vectors form a basis if and only if for any target vectors in a different Euclidean space, there exists a unique linear map. Let's call it F from Rn into Rm so that F of Xi is being mapped to the target vector. So the target vectors is where you want to send these. The target vectors tell you where the basis vectors go. So why is this possible? Well, here's the reason why this is possible. So why does this work? So the reason why this works is because if you give something an Rn, If you pick something in Rn, you can write that something as a sum of basis vectors in a unique way. There's a unique way to do it. 
And then if f is a linear map, then that would mean that f of x would distribute in a linear way. It would be a1 f of x1 plus a2 f of x2 and so on. And these are the target vectors. So all of these have to be replaced by the target vectors. And so this is how the map is defined. This is how f is defined. And one can check that f is linear. You can check that f is a linear mapping. Basically, the reason for that is you're forcing f to be a linear mapping with this property. So that's the way you, you, you define f. The way you define f is you take a vector in Rn, you decompose it with the basis vectors, and then you define f of x, f of x to be this. You just replace the basis vectors by the target vectors, and f of x is then defined to be equal to that. Now, the reason why we define it to be equal to that is because if the function was to be linear, then that's exactly what needs to happen. And then you can verify that f is indeed a, a linear uh, function. Now, the reason why it's important that you have a basis, you see, the reason why it's important that you have a basis is because when you take this vector x, you can always decompose it into vectors. So there's a there's an way of decomposing it. And secondly, there's a unique way to do it. If the vectors do not form a basis, you might, you might have one of two problems. One problem might be is that perhaps x cannot be decomposed in such a way. But an alternative problem that can happen is what if x can be decomposed in more than one way? Then it's not well defined. There's issues about how to then go ahead and define f of x. So this is an alternative way to characterize a basis. Basically, a basis is a collection of vectors in Rn that have this universe, like, I guess you can say it's almost like a universal mapping property that if you're given target vectors in a different space, there's a unique linear map from Rn into the other space that sends the basis vectors into the required target vectors. So it's you really are saying the same thing, but this is a more abstract way of looking at it. And I bring it up right now because we're going to see something very similar happen when we talk about groups. But I want to just show you an example. So here's an example. So in this example, let x1 be the vector 1, 0, x2 be the vector 0, 1, and x3 is the vector 1, 1, and these are vectors in R2. Now, these are certainly not a basis, because a basis will consist of two vectors, and here we have three vectors. So, of course, they do not form a basis. But I'm going to illustrate to you the problem that happens if they do not form a basis. So we have these three vectors. They do not form a basis. And now we're going to pick target vectors. So let's go ahead and pick target vectors. So we're going to pick three target vectors, because at the moment we have three vectors. So the target vectors will be 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And these are target vectors in R3. And the question is, is there a linear map mapping R2 into R3 and f of xi is equal to yi? Now, here you're going to have a problem, precisely because these three vectors do not form a basis. But let's see what the problem is. So we're asking, is there such a linear map? And the answer is no, there is no such linear map. And why is there no such linear map? Well, it has to do with the following. You see this vector x3? This vector x3 is actually in disguise x1 plus x2. So the linear map, if f is a linear map, it's supposed to satisfy. So it would mean that f of x3 would be equal to f of x1 plus x2, which would be equal to f of x1 plus f of x2. And then we're saying that um, x1, the target vector, has to be 1, 0, 0. And the target vector for x2 is supposed to be 0, 1, 0. And so f of x3 has to be mapped to 1, 1, 0. But we also want that f of x3 is equal to the third target vector, y3, which is 0, 0, 1. And we have a contradiction. See, we have a contradiction that those two are in contradiction with each other. So it is impossible to find a linear map 
and we'll map R2 to R3, and we'll map these three vectors to those three vectors. And the problem happens because you do not have a basis, because one of these vectors is redundant. Right? Like an equivalent way of saying that you have a basis is to say that no vector in the list is a linear combination of the other vectors. So no vector is redundant in the list. But here, x3 is redundant. x3 is the sum of those two. So this is what we call a relationship. We call this a relation or a relationship. So if the vectors do not form a basis, well, if some of, I should say this, if the vectors are redundant, if you have a list of vectors and some of them are, are redundant, then that means one of the vectors is expressible in terms of the other ones. And so you have a relationship. And if you have a linear mapping, that relationship needs to be preserved. So the target vectors will have to satisfy that y3 has to be equal to y1 plus y2. That is an absolute requirement to have on the target vectors. But since the target vectors are not required to satisfy any relationships, you're just free to pick them to be in any way you want, that means you're not guaranteed for you to have a linear map that will satisfy this requirement unless the target vectors are chosen in a very special way. And the special way is they also have to satisfy the same kind of relationship. But when you have a basis, but a basis, but a basis is free from any relationship. There is no relationship in a basis. So because of that, when you have a collection of basis vectors, you can send them to target vectors without any kind of restrictions. You can always do it because of basis vectors, there's no relationship between the basis vectors. So a contradiction will not be obtained when you apply the linear map. So this example nicely illustrates why you need to have a basis. So now let's make the same similar definition for a group. So here's a definition. So I'm going to call this the intuitive version, and I'll give you the rigorous version afterwards. So let G be a group. Let G be a group. And it does not have to be commutative. In general, it's not going to be commutative. So let G be a group. So we say that a collection of, now we're not, now these are not called vectors anymore. They're just called elements. So we say that these in G are basis elements for G. Well, actually, it's not even intuitive. Uh, I'm just going to call this definition one. This is one version. They're both useful. Let G be a group. We say a collection of elements in G are basis elements for G if and only if any element in G can be expressed uniquely as a product of the basis elements. So expressed uniquely as a product of the basis element. So let me show you, for example, for example, maybe the x can be written like this, x1, x2, x3. So x1 is the, so this is basically the binary operation. Uh, we suppress the binary operation. So we just write x1, x2, and x3. So that's one way to do it. Or you can have x is equal to, let's say, x1 squared x2. So that just means, this is just another way of saying x1, 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 x2. But let's call this prime. Let, let's say we have a different element. Or if we have another element, you can also write it like this. You can maybe write it as x1, x2, x1 inverse. You can write it like that. Well, that's the inverse element of x1. That's another way how you can write it. Notice that uh, if we do not assume that these are commutative, you cannot necessarily rewrite them the other way around. So there's a unique way to write it. Right? There's a unique way to put them together to express x as a product of those three. So maybe this x factors like this, maybe x prime factors like this, maybe x double prime factors like this, and there's no other way to factor it. That's the only way you can do it. Right? That's what I mean, expressed as a product of basis elements. Uh, if you want to, you can also say, so every element in G is a word, right? it's a word of basis elements 
and there is a unique way to write this word. So it's like a word, right? If, if you look at this, this is like a word in these three letters, and this is another word, and that's another word, but you throw in an inverse. So these are words, but there's a unique way to write those words, and there's no other way to write it. So that's like definition one. This is not exactly the most rigorous definition, but it gets the idea across. It's just like vector spaces and basis in a vector space. So a more rigorous definition, I'm going to take this down. Here's a more rigorous definition. Is you can say, it's, it's really saying the same thing, but more rigorously, definition uh, two. This is equivalent to it. This is an alternative way to say that. So we say that x1 up to xn in some group are basis elements if and only if for any other group, for any other group, let's call it h, and target elements, say y1, y2, yn in h, there is a unique There is a, a unique group homomorphism. From G to H, so that F of XI get send to the required target elements. Okay, so, so this is an alternative way how you can describe it. That's what it means to have a basis. And I want to show you some notation that we use. So let me take this down. I want to show you some notation. So notation. So if we write G is equal to, and we put bracket X, Y, that means G is generated by symbols X and Y. Okay. Um, maybe with symbols, maybe I should say with basis, with basis X and Y. So if you write out G as a set, so if you want to write out G as a set, you, you'd actually have to write it out as a set. You can think of it more abstractly as satisfying that mapping property. So this would just mean that these, are, these form basis elements for G. And so if you have any other group and you have a pair of target target elements, then these two can be sent to any two target elements. Right? That, that you can think of it more abstractly like that as a mapping property, but it's also helpful to think of it more intuitively as like a set of elements. So as a set of elements, it's going to be generated. So you say G is a group and these two vectors, not vectors, elements. But you know, you know, maybe I'll keep on saying vectors because I'm sure I'll make the mistake and I'll keep on um, by mistake saying the word vector. Uh, multiple times in this lecture, so maybe I should just allow the mistake to go on. So we have these two elements, and then we'll say G is a group with that basis. So when you write it out as a set, here's the way it looks like. You're going to write one. One, this is just the identity. A group always has the identity. And then you're going to have X. You're going to have Y. But then you have X squared. Okay, you're going to have X squared. And then you're going to have Y squared. Right, x times x, because it's a group. It's a group. So if x is in G, then x times x is in G. But that's x squared. And by the way, there is no. Let me uh, indicate this. There is no relationship, relation or relationship formed by these basis elements. But what I mean is, you, it never happens that let's say x squared is equal to y squared. That's not going to happen, because if that happens, then you have a relationship. Sort of like in a vector space where one of the vectors can be expressed in terms of the other vector. So then you're saying y can be expressed in terms of x squared. That would be a relationship. So you do not have that. So you have one x, y. x squared has to be distinct from whatever you have on the list. y squared has to be distinct from whatever you have on the list. Then you'll have x, y. Right? You can do x times y. And you can do y times x. We're not saying the group is commuted. x times y. y times x. We can also have x, y, x. We can have y, x, y. We can have x, x, y, which you can write as x squared, y. We can write it like this, x squared, y. And this is starting to look like binary in a way. x, y, 
y, x squared, and so on. And then you also have the inverses. You have x inverse, you have y inverse. You can have x times y inverse. You can have x, y squared. That just means two inverses together. And then you have x negative 3, y negative 1, and so on. All of these are examples of words that are in this G, and they're all distinct from one another. Under no circumstances will this word be equal to that word. Because if they were equal, if they were equal, if you were to equate them, if y, x was equal to x squared, y, what would that mean? Well, you can first of all cancel the y from this side, put it over here. And then you can cancel, then you can cancel maybe the x, x negative 2. Well, you can maybe cancel one of the x's, so you have x negative 1, and then you would have x. And that would mean that every occurrence of x that you see can be replaced by that. So there's some kind of relationship that allows you to, re to express x in terms of something else. So when you have basis vectors, basis vectors, basis elements, when you have basis elements, these kinds of relations will not exist. So that's the idea, sort of like the intuitive idea of what we're trying to say as far as words and symbols are concerned. And let's uh, introduce uh, the following uh, definition. We say a group F, let's call it F. We say a group F is free of rank N if and only if there is a collection, a basis of N elements in F. And we write, and the notation that we use is we write that F is the group with bases generated by the basis elements x1 to xn. That's what these brackets mean. This just means that, that this is like F is generated by basis elements x1 to xn. That's what that means. That's what it means to be free of rank n. This is similar to what we talk about the dimension of a vector space. So when we say the dimension of the vector space is five, there's five basis vectors. That, that's kind of the same idea. So that's what it means for, for a group to be free of rank n. And then we can say that, and we say that f is free. We say f is free, is a free group if it has a basis. So a free group is a group that has a basis. It has basis elements. And you say free group of rank n, that's sort of like the dimension. Except in group theory, we do not call it the dimension. We call it something else. There's a reason for why we do not call it the dimension. Because uh, the dimension is supposed to behave a lot nicer. For instance, you learn in a linear algebra class that if you have a vector space and you have a subspace, then the subspace has a basis, and the dimension of the subspace is always smaller than the dimension of the ambient space. The dimension always goes down. But with groups, the situation is a lot more complicated. Uh, we do not need to know this, but you can have, first of all, a group is not guaranteed to have a basis. Some groups have no basis at all, unlike what you do in vector spaces. Vector spaces always have a basis, but groups do, do not necessarily have a basis. And I'll show you an example very soon. It's actually quite simple. And also, if a group does have a basis, a free group, the subgroup of it, you can find the subgroup that has a larger basis than the group of the ambient group, which is so strange, but that's exactly how it works. So calling it a dimension would be confusing. So because of this, um, mathematicians find it better to call it rank, because dimension is supposed to behave a little bit nicer, so you call it rank. It's free of rank n. And you say it's free, you say f is a free group if it has a basis. Let's give an example of a group that has no basis. An example of a group that is not free. So in other words, it has no basis. So this is going to be an example of a group that is not free. So you can do this. You can pick G to be z mod 2z. So uh, you can write this as 0 mod 2 as the class and 1 mod 2. 
So as a set, this is 0, plus 2, minus 2, and so on. And this is the set of integers that are congruent to 1 mod 2. So 1, minus 1, 3, and so on. And the way the group structure is defined is that if you take two of these classes, you add them by choosing representatives. So if you want to add this one with this one, you just choose anything in here. You choose anything in there. You add them, and the answer is whatever class contain, contains that integer. This is a well-defined operation, and this is what we call integers mod 2. And we claim, we claim that if x is in G, then x squared is equal to 1. So i.e., so you have to understand what x squared means. x squared means x times x. But in this case, uh, we interpret this as addition. So um, we, in general, we write x squared. But using the, this notation, you can also say x plus x, right? You're just operating on x twice. The operation here is denoted by addition, and 1 is the identity element. Well, the identity element here is technically 0. So you're saying this, that if you take, if you take something and you add it to itself, you get 0. So the identity element is this. And this is clearly true. You can see that 0 mod 2 plus 0 mod 2 is 0 mod 2. And 1 mod 2 plus 1 mod 2, that would be 2 mod 2, but 2 mod 2 is 0. So this relationship is satisfied. Thus, any collection of elements will satisfy, so any collection of elements, xi, will satisfy the relation that x squared is 1. So it is not possible to find a basis. Because a basis is supposed to be free from any relationship. And this is a relationship. This is a relationship that is forced on this group that everything squares to 1. And again, when we say squares to 1, we really mean anything added to itself is the identity element. So this group is not free. It is not possible to find a basis, because no matter how many basis elements you pick, in this case, there's only two. You can, at most, you can only pick two. But regardless of whether you pick one or two of them, they will always have this relationship that they will square to 1. They will square to the identity. And so it will not form a basis, because you always have relations present. So this is like an example, a very simple example of a group that is not free. Now, let's give an example of something that is free. So in this example, let's say that, that the integers is a free group of rank 1. So you're saying the integers have a basis of consisting of a single of a single basis element. You only need one basis element to do that. And that's exactly how it works. Because when we write out the integers, what do we have? We have the identity element. We have 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, and so on. So this is, this is our identity element, right? This is the identity. We can make this be x. Then this would be x to the negative 1. That's the inverse of x, right? That would be x to the negative 1. This one is 1 plus 1. So you can write this as x squared. And then this one would be the inverse. So this would be x to the negative 2. This one would be x to the 3. This is x to the negative 3. And so what you see is that the, the integers, when you write them out, you have the identity element. Uh, you can write it either as 1 or 0, but maybe writing it as uh, 0, or maybe writing it as 1 is a little bit confusing because 1 is really x. So maybe we'll just write, we have the identity element. And then we have powers of x, and then we have the negative powers of x. And this forms a basis. The, the group of integers is a free group of rank 1. Okay, so that would be a free group of rank 1, that, that you have a basis. And by the way, you can pick, for x, you can either pick negative 1, but you can also replace negative 1 and you, well, for x you pick 1, but you can replace x by negative 1. Negative 1 also works. Then you would just interchange these two. So these two would just be interchanged. So you just interchange the positives with the negatives. You can use negative 1 as a basis also. So this would be an example of a free group of rank 1. 
we already gave an example of a free group of ring two. That, so that was the example where we said that G is the group that has two basis elements. So we, we looked at that, that that would be an example of a free group of rank two. Now, what's interesting was when you have a, um, a free group of rank one is actually an abelian group. So this one is abelian. Or if you prefer to say, it's commutative. Because you only have x and everything's uh, expressed as a power of x. This one is not commutative. Because in this one, xy is treated differently from yx. They have to be treated differently, otherwise you have a relation. Whereas here, you do not come across that problem because you only have symbols involving x. There's no other symbol. So the only, the only free group that is abelian is the free group of rank one. All of the other ones become non-abelian. So let's also introduce this notation. So usually, most groups are not free. And we can describe, we can describe those groups by using something called generators and relations. So let me first show you some examples, and then I'll give you a more formal definition for what we're doing. We'll give a more rigorous definition using mapping properties. But for now, let's just look at these examples. So G is equal to X, and then you put this bar over here, and you write X cubed is equal to 1. So in words, you're saying G is generated by the symbol x and it has the relation this is the relationship that x satisfies that its cubed is equal to 1 okay so you think of the of this side as being the generators so the generators is i like to think of this as the alphabet so those are the symbols which everything gets expressed by and these are called the relations and I like to think of this as the grammar for your language. Those are like the rules for your language. So you have an alphabet that only consists of one symbol, and that symbol is X. And the grammar, the rules for this language, is that whenever you have three occurrences of X, it just goes away and it becomes one. It becomes the identity. So if you write out this group as a set, you have the identity element, you have X, and you have X squared. You're not going to write x cubed because x cubed gets replaced by just 1. So that's redundant. You're not going to write x to the fourth because x to the fourth would be x cubed times x, but this is just 1. So that would just be x. So you have 1x and x squared. And you may wonder, well, what about inverses? Do you write x inverse? You do not write x inverse because x times x squared is 1. Right? If x cubed is 3, then x times x squared is 1. So that means this is the inverse. That's the thing it gets multiplied by to get you the identity. So x inverse would just be x squared. So this is actually your group. So this is a finite group, right? This is a finite group. The previous examples were not finite, but this is a finite group. So you're saying, I have a group. It has a generator, but that generator has a relation. In a free group, when you put down the generator, there is no relation that goes there. That's what it means to be free. It's free from generators. But if you put the relations over here, then you're saying what kind of relationships those symbols need to satisfy. So here are the relationships that the symbols need to satisfy is they have to cube to 1. Okay, and then it would be 1x x squared. Uh, can we identify this group? So you can show, so it turns out, this is isomorphic to the integers mod 3. Uh, because if you write the integers mod 3, what do you have? You have 0 mod 1. That's the identity class. You have 1 mod 3. I'm sorry, 0 mod 3, 1 mod 3, and 2 mod 3. So if you call this x, so this is 1 and this is x squared. Also, you can also do it in a different way. So you can either do it like this, 1x x squared. So this is this plays the role of x. x squared means you add it to itself, right? So do not square the number 1, add 1 to itself. x squared is x plus x. So x plus x will be 2 mod 3, and then you kind of recover this. Alternatively, you can also do it like this. This would be your identity. You can call that one x, and then you call that one x squared. Because in this case, if it's 2 mod 3, 
then adding this to itself twice will be four mod three, which is again one mod three. So then you recover that. So uh, th these are like the different ways to do it. So you can identify this group as something that's more familiar. This group is more familiar to us. So you can say that this is the integers mod three, either where x plays the role of one mod three, or the other thing you can say, you can also say where x plays the role of two mod three. So uh, both of those interpretations work. So this is an example of generators and relations. To give you another example of generators and relations, let's look at something like this. Let's say we have a group and it consists of the symbols, let's call the symbols x, y. So those are the generators, that's the alphabet, and the relationships are x squared is equal to one, and the other one is y cubed is equal to one, and you have another relationship, and that is x, y is equal to y, x. So x and y commute together. So if you start writing this out as a set, you would have one, you would have x, you would have y. You're not going to have x squared because that becomes one, uh, one, but you could have y squared. Y squared is not a relation here. You're not gonna have y cubed, but you're gonna have y squared. You can also multiply, you can multiply x with y, so you can have x, y, but you're not gonna multiply, you're not gonna do this. You're not gonna do this because x squared is one, so that's just y again, so you can have x, y, and you can also multiply x with y squared, so you would have x, y squared. However, you will not write y, x, because y, x, it, it commutes. X and Y commute together. This is a commutative group. So Y and X commute together, so there's no need to write that down. Uh, you can also have, what else? One, two, three, four, five, six, and that's it. And that's really all you can have. You're not gonna write X, Y, X, for example, because then you can interchange these two. This would be Y, X, X, but X, this is X squared, which is just one. So that would just be Y. So if you play around with these, you will notice that the only way you can write out this group using these symbols that satisfy these rules is there's only six of them there. There's only six. And I leave it as an exercise so you can check. You can check that G is actually isomorphic. You can identify this as a more familiar group, and that group is, is Z mod 6Z. It's actually the integers mod 6. Now, let me show you what happens if we were to remove one of the relations. So let's remove this relation over here. So let's remove the commutative relation. So let's say this is the group that we had. So this side, these are called the generators. So that's the alphabet that you use to express every element. And these over here, we call these the relations. That's sort of like the rules of the alphabet. That's the grammar of the symbols. Those are the relationships. If you start to write out what this group is, you will not write x squared because that gets simplified to one. However, because it's no longer commutative, you start having the following situations happen. You can have x, y, you can have x, y, x, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, and so on. And you can make that be arbitrarily long. And there's no way to simplify this any further because there's no rule for interchanging x and y. There's no commutative rule. So that you have to just um, keep these going forever. So this is actually an infinite group. This is an infinite group. So you can see by just removing a single relation, we went from a very simple, easy to understand group with six elements into a group that now has an infinite number of elements by just removing a single relation. So things can get very dramatic very quickly when you just introduce one relation or you remove one relation. Now I wanna show you how to describe this group more abstractly. So if you want to think of G as a set of symbols and you know how to multiply them together. So like for instance, if you want to multiply, let's say this. So like for example, it, like these rules, they tell you how to do the multiplication. So let's say you want to multiply this word by this word. So then you would have X, Y, X multiplied by X, Y, but then you have X, Y, X squared, Y, and X squared becomes one. So in the end, you get left with x, y squared. So you can see is the product of these two is actually equal to that, right? So you can express that as a product of those two. So um, you can write out all of these symbols and all of these words, and then these are like the simplification rules for you to follow. Uh, so this is a much more, you can say, a more intuitive way of thinking about what's going on. But if you want like a more abstract type of definition for what this is, so here's the way you can describe it. So here is an abstract, here is an abstract uh, characterization 
of G. So it says this, we can find, so for any, for any group H and target elements, let's call those target elements, for lack of a better name, A and B, such that A squared is 1 and B cubed is 1 in H, of course. So if you find the group that has two elements, one of them is a square that squares to one and the other one cubes to one, then there is a unique map. There's a unique map, a unique homomorphism, I should say. F from G to H so that f of x is equal to a and f of y is equal to b. So this is the abstract mapping property of whatever this group is. So you're describing this group in this abstract with this abstract mapping properties. It's universal in the sense, so we're basically saying it's universal. It's like the optimal group that has two symbols that satisfy these rules. A square is one and a cube is one. Out of all groups, this is the optimal one. This is the one that can always be mapped somewhere else. It's like the optimal group out of all groups that have that kind of property. So we're saying, you, like, if you give me any group H, now this other group H that you give me, it may satisfy these relations and it may satisfy even extra relations. That's okay. But you have to use this additional requirement. Uh, you cannot use the, you see, in a free group, you are free to make the target elements be anything you want. But this group is not free. So you're not free to choose A and B in any way you want to in H. Instead, A and B have to be chosen to satisfy those kinds of relations. So you're saying that if you pick target elements in some other group and those target elements in the other group satisfy those kinds of relationships, then there is a unique homomorphism from that group into H that will map its, uh, we're not going to call them basis uh, elements because they're no longer basis elements, but it will map those two elements to the required target elements. So that is the the like the mapping version of what this G is. Okay, so let me tell you, therefore, what combinatorial group theory is about. So what is combinatorial group theory? What is combinatorial group theory? And also, why do we care? But the reason why we care is because it's going to come up later in the course. You're going to see how it comes up. But what is combinatorial group theory? So put simply is we describe a group by generators and relations. And the fundamental uh, problem in combinatorial group theory is to determine whether two group presentations are isomorphic. So this is called the group presentation. So when you give generators and relations, that's what we call a group presentation. You are presenting a group through its generators and through its relations. We call that the group presentation. So for example, let's say I tell you that G1 is the group that has these two generators. These two generators generate every element in G1 and the relationships that they satisfy is that X1 is one, Y cubed is one, and they commute. And I give you another group that has, let's say a symbol, it doesn't really matter what the symbol is, but let's call it Z. And the relationship here is that z, z to the 6 is equal to 1. And then I ask you, are G1 isomorphic to G2? Are these isomorphic groups? Well, at first, if you look at this, you're going to say, of course they're not isomorphic. Here you have two generators. Here you have one generator. And here you have three relations. And here you just have one relation. But if you recall what we said earlier, it turns out that this group is actually isomorphic to Z mod 6Z. That's what we said. It's actually isomorphic. It's a complicated way of presenting 6 mod 6z, but that is a presentation for that group. And this group, G2, well, you have a single generator that whose 6 power is 1. That's the class 1 mod 6. 1 mod 6, when you add it 6 times, gives you 1. So this is also a, a different presentation for z mod 6z. So the point is, is that you can have, so we can have, we can have two very different looking presentations 
that describe the same group as far as isomorphism is concerned. And that's why we call it actually combinatorial group theory. It's it's not it's like combinatorics. You're not you're not actually counting combinations, but you're like considering different combinations of letters pretty much. That's why we call it combinatorial group theory. You're interested in the different combinations that you can form. So here you have two letters, and these are like the combinations that they satisfy. Here you have one letter, and this is the relationship that is being satisfied. And, and then you, we can see that they're actually isomorphic to each other in this case. But in general, what if you have 50 relations, and you have, yeah, what if you have, let's say, 20 generators and 50 relations? What do you say? How do you, what can you possibly say about that group? And that is what is known, this is sort of like the fundamental this is sort of like the fundamental uh, problem in what we call combinatorial group theory, where you want to understand the group through its generators and relations. That's sort of the fundamental question, generators and relations. And we call that a group presentation. And what's interesting is, maybe I can add, add this comment, there is no general purpose algorithm that can determine if two group presentations are the same. So general purpose algorithm, what I mean is, in the most general sense possible, if I give you two group presentations and I ask you if the two groups are isomorphic or not, there is no systematic algorithm that will work for every type of problem. Okay, that, that's actually been proven that there is no, that no such algorithm can exist. Um, in fact, you can have uh, very funny situations where you can have like 600 generators and 700 relations and all of that is just a description of the trivial group. So you can have funny things happen like that. And there's no easy way to look at that and to know um, what kind of a group that is. So uh, it's kind of like, it's basically like asking the question, you want an equation to solve, well, you want a formula to solve every single type of equation that can conceivably exist. Well, there is no such thing. You have formulas for special types of problems. So if you have a special type of problem, you might have a formula for solving that problem. If you have a different problem, you have a different formula. And, uh, and that's kind of the same thing over here. In combinatorial group theory, there is no such thing as the golden algorithm that will solve every problem in every case and every situation. Instead, you have different types of problems for which there is a method for solving. And if you're interested, it's called the word problem for groups. Let me bring this up on Wikipedia, just so we get to see this. So this is called the word problem for groups, because it's essentially, we're describing words using generators, right? And it's, as it says over here, it's like a formal type of language of all words that you can form. And they give you examples. So the following groups have a solvable word problem. So they give you examples of groups for which it is, there's an algorithm for determining if two groups are isomorphic. So if you have a finite group, if you have two finite groups, let's say, there is an algorithm to determine whether those two presentations are isomorphic to each other. However, the funny part is, I'm pretty sure there is no algorithm to determine if a group is finite in the first place. So if I give you a... Uh, if I give you a bunch of generators and relations and I ask you, does that describe a finite group? Uh, I do not think there's an algorithm for doing that. So that's the funny part. So there's no algorithm to determine if a group is finite to begin with, but if somehow you know that you have two finite groups to, uh, to begin with and you know uh, on top of that that, um, that they're described by generators and relations, then in that case, there is an algorithm to determine if they're isomorphic or not. Uh, well, uh, next class, I wanna talk about this. Next class, I want to talk about, um, actually, I want to talk about this. So, not free groups, yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about this, finally, finitely generated, actually, drop the word free. Uh, next class, I want, I want to show you how it works for abelian groups. So, if you have two abelian groups, and they have generators and relations, then there's actually a fairly straightforward procedure to determine if they're isomorphic or not. And interestingly, it uses linear algebra, so it would fit nicely with our discussion. So I think we should at least know that case. And as it mentions over here, one relator groups, right? One relator groups. So this means where you only have one relation. If you have a single relation, 
then there's a way to determine that. And as it mentions down here, it says fundamental groups of two-dimensional manifolds. This is something we're going to discuss later in this course. The fundamental group, two-dimensional manifold is a surface. So the fundamental group of surfaces. So at some point we will discuss how you calculate the fundamental group of surfaces and we will have an algorithm to determine if those two fundamental groups are isomorphic or not. So we will, so basically what we're doing is we're solving the word problem as we call it, the word problem, but we're solving a word problem in a very special class of problems. So for us, we're only going to be interested in surfaces, the fundamental groups of surfaces. And therefore we will describe an algorithm to solve the word problem when you have that kind of situation. But in general, there is no general purpose algorithm. So that's what we're saying. Okay. So, uh, so that is what, so this is what um, combinatorial group theory is about. And there are some special cases for which there is a method to determine if the two groups are isomorphic. So that's what we're going to be doing later. But for now, what I want to do is, so to continue with the discussion, let us say something about products and co-products. Uh, this will be used again in the upcoming lectures. So it makes sense to mention it right now because it fits very nicely with the current theme. So let's say what the product is. So definition. And this is going to be very interesting. It's just like a product for topological spaces. So let's say what the product is. So let G1 and G2 be two groups. Okay, we have two groups. The product group, the product group, let's call it P, the product group. Uh, previously, we talked about the product space. So the, uh, the product group is a group with two homomorphisms. So let's call those uh, homomorphisms pi 1 and pi 2, which is universal or optimal with this property. And instead of writing out what we mean universal with this property, I'll just draw a picture for what we mean. So what we're saying is if we have two groups, G1 and G2, the product group is a group that comes equipped with two projections. Well, we call them projections, but they're just homomorphisms. We call them pi 1 and pi 2. So there's two homomorphisms that it comes equipped with, and it's universal. It's the optimal, it's the optimal such one that has this property. So think of it as the supremum. This P is smaller than G1 and G2, right? It's like a supremum. It's smaller than these two. It's like a least upper bound. And if there's any other group, let's call it H, that comes equipped with its own homomorphisms, F and G, then P is optimal in the sense that it's the supremum. It's like the least upper bound. This is smaller than those two, but this is the least upper bound. That I'm sorry, this is bigger, so P is, is larger than, than these two, and this is larger than this two, but this is the least upper bound, so it's smaller than that. So there is a therefore a mapping. There exists a unique mapping. Let's call that unique, unique mapping H, unique homomorphism, that will make this diagram commute. So you have a pair of triangles. You have a triangle going like this. That triangle commutes. And then you have a triangle going like that. That triangle commutes. So that would be the universal mapping property for the product. It's exactly just like topological spaces. It, it, it's exactly the same way. The, the difference is instead of topological spaces, it is groups. And instead of continuous maps, it's homomorphisms. But other than that, it's the same idea. And what I leave to you is how, okay, so the claim is that H, so this P exists. So the proposition that I want to mention is P, the product group, the product group exists. So there is such a group that satisfies that property. And here's the construction. So here's the construction. Construction for P. So here's the way you do it. You're going to use the Cartesian product. It's just like vectors. It's, I'm sorry. It's just like topological spaces. You're going to take the Cartesian product. And then for an element, let's call it G1, comma, G2 in the Cartesian product. And for another element, let's call it G1 prime, 
G2 prime in the Cartesian. Well, that made no sense. I meant to say G1 times G2. G1 times G2. So for something in the Cartesian product, we define the following operation. So we have to define what it means to multiply two pairs because we're trying to turn this into a group. So at the moment, this is as a set, right? So, so that's what the, what the product group is as a set. So that's what it is as a set. But you have to turn it into a group. So you have to have a way of defining how to multiply this pair with that pair. And the way you do it is that you probably can guess the way you do it. You just multiply component by component. That's the way you do it. So this is, of course, the multiplication that happens in the first coordinate because G1 and G2 come from G1. So this is the multiplication that takes place in G1, and this is the multiplication that takes place in G2. We do not put the binary operation symbol. We suppress it to keep the notation simple, but we, of course, interpret it the correct way, that this is the operation that's happening here, and this is the operation that's happening here. So, that's, so, so then the claim is it can be checked that P is a group and it satisfies the universal property. So this is, uh, I'm going to put this as a homework problem for you to check that this construction will create for you the product group. So the product group will end up satisfying um, this property that you want. Okay. And let's talk about how you do this using group presentations. So suppose we are given two group presentations for G1 and G2. How can we find the group presentation for G1 for the product for the product group of G1 and G2? How do you find it for the product group? So so for example, okay, so for example, let me give you an example. So let's say that G1 is the group is the group Z. And you can give it the following presentation. You can say this is the group that has the presentation X, and that is it. There is no relations because this is a free group. There, there's no other relationships. And then you have another group, G2, which is going to be Z again. So then the relationship here is just going to be Y. I, I, I deliberately want to use a different letter. I want to use two different letters so you can tell them apart. This is going to make it a little bit easier. So we have two groups, G1 and G2. How do we find the product? So how do we, how do we express the product as a group presentation? So here's the way we do it. So the product group, let's call it P, that this is going to be the product group. So here's the way you're going to do it. I'm going to tell you what the answer is, and then I'll explain to you why that works. I think it's just going to make more sense to just show you how you do it first. So the way you do it is you take the two generators and you write them down. So you would say it's the group that is generated by the symbols X and Y. And then you're going to take you're going to take the relationship, right? So these are the relationships. Well, there's no relationships here, right? There's no it's a free group. There's no relationships. But if they had relationships, you would take those two relationships and you would put them down. The relationships they persist. And there's one more thing you have to do, which at the moment might not seem clear. But there's one more thing you have to do, and the one more thing you have to do is you have to introduce a commutative relationship between x and y. So you're going to write over here that xy is equal to yx, okay? So that would be the group presentation for the product group, okay? So let's actually check that this gives the right answer. I'll explain to you why you have to make it commutative afterwards, but I just want to show you why this gives you the right answer. So here's why it gives you the right answer. Let's start writing out what P is. If you write out what P is, you have the identity, you have x, you have y, you have x squared, you have y squared, you have xy, 
but you're not going to write. So you're not going to write x, y, x, because if you write x, y, x, that would be the same thing as x squared y, right? So you would have x squared y, you would have x, y squared, you would have x cubed y, you would have x, y cubed, and so on. So basically, basically every element has the form x to some integer and y to some integer, right? It's a pair of integers. Because it's commutative, you can move it around. It's a pair of integers. So it's x to the i, y to the j. There's two integers that you need to describe every word in this group. How many times are you using x? How many times you're using y? Because it's commutative, because you can write it the other way around. Now, the reason why this is the correct answer is because what happens if we take the Cartesian product? So let's see what happens if we take the Cartesian product. So when we take the Cartesian product of z with itself, which is really what we're doing because both of these groups, so that, that's what we're doing because that these are these two groups. Yeah, because we're trying to compute, we're trying to find a presentation for the product. So let's actually find what the product is as a set when you write it out. So this would be, this would consist of all pairs. You would have 0, 0, you would have 1, 0, you would have 0, 1. You will have the negative numbers as well and all of that. But in general, you have i comma j where i and j are integers. And look at that. That's exactly what you have here. Basically, x is playing the role of 1, 0, and 0, 1 is playing the role of y. And that's basically what you have at the end. That's the reason why you have to introduce that commutative relationship because if you did not introduce the commutative relationship, then you will clearly not get the same answer as you would get if you just took the Cartesian product of them. So the way you find the group presentation for the product group is to repeat it again. You copy, you copy the relations. So it's convenient to use different letters to avoid confusion. You're not going to use an X there and an X here. You just, you, just, you, you just use two different letters. You take those two different letters, you write them down, and then you introduce the relation of the commutative relationship between those two. And that will give you a presentation for the product. Let me give you another example. Okay, so here's another example. Let's say G1 is the group Z mod 2Z. And a presentation for this group can be given as it's generated by X, where X squared is 1. And G2 is the group Z mod 3Z. So the presentation for this group is Y with the relation Y cubed is equal to 1. And let's find, and P, this is the product group. So here is the presentation for the product group. Here's the way you would write it. You would take the two generators and you combine them together. So now you have two. Okay, now you have two of them. Then you take the relations, you combine them together. So you have x squared is 1, y cubed is 1. Okay, and then you have to introduce a commutative relationship between the ones here and the ones here. So you would have to say x, y is equal to y, x. And that would be the product group. Okay, that's the way that would be the product group. And by the way, if you realize what this is, we've said this before, this is isomorphic to z mod 6z. So, so z mod 2z, Cartesian product z mod 3z is isomorphic to z mod 6z. Uh, you, can, you can check, right? You can actually check that this works. Uh, but that's... So that's what you have to do, because if you did not write down this relationship, if you only had that, we had this example before, this would actually be an infinite group. It would just keep on going. So you need that commutative relationship. That's absolutely necessary. And the way this commutative relationship comes up is that when you look at the product group, so if you think of the product group as this Cartesian product, and this is G1 and that's G2, if you have an element in the product group, you have a pair of these, uh, you have a pair of these homomorphisms. So this homomorphism is mapping this onto the first coordinate, to G1, and this is the one that's mapping it to G2. Now what you should notice is that you can write this as G1 comma 0 plus 0 comma G2. Well, I mean, if you use, if it just depends whether you use addition, it depends whether you use multiplicative operation. Um, maybe we should use multiplicative operate, uh, multiplicative notation. So g1 comma 1 times 1 comma g2. That would be one way to write it. 
because then you have g times 1 is g1, and 1 times g2 is g2. But you can also write it like this. You can also write it as 1g2 and 1g1. This also, uh, no, no, that's incorrect. You would write it as g1 comma 1. This also works. So you can see that, that th these commute with each other. So even though g1 and g2 are not commutative groups, when you write this in this kind of a fashion, they now commute with each other. So that means whatever generator you have here and whatever generator you have there, the corresponding generator in the product, it has to satisfy. So if this is like one generator and that's the other generator, then they have to satisfy this rule that you can interchange them. So that's the requirement for why you have to add the commutative relations into the presentation. So that's what we call products. Now what about coproducts? So let's talk about coproducts for groups. So definition, let uh, G1 and G2 be two groups. The coproduct, the coproduct group, we can call it C. Uh, sometimes people also call this the free product. Uh, you'll see why that is, the free product. So the coproduct group, which is denoted by, so the notation that we use is this. This is supposed to represent the coproduct between G1 and G2. It is a group, uh, C, uh, that has homomorphisms. Let's call them I1 from G1 into G. So it's just like the, the product, but this is the coproduct, so the arrows go in the opposite direction. And I2 from G2 into C. So it is a group that has homomorphisms, which are universal. So what does that mean? So to draw a picture for you, we're saying that we have G1, we have G2. The coproduct, for the coproduct, you can find a pair of, of homomorphisms so that if you have any other group, let's call it G, and if you can find a pair of homomorphisms going into G, then there is a unique homomorphism. So this is I1, this is I2, let's call this one F, let's call this G. So for the coproduct, you have a pair of homomorphisms going into G, so that if you have any other group with a pair of homomorphisms F and G that map from G1 and G2 into G, then there exists a unique mapping from the coproduct into G, let's call it H, that will make this diagram commute. So it's just like with the product, just like the product, but the arrows go in the other direction. And we call that the free product. So this is the abstract description of the coproduct. But let's uh, determine, so let's discuss, so let us discuss, so let us discuss how to uh, determine the coproduct using group group presentations. Okay, so here's the way we would do it. So let's say we want to find the coproduct between Z and Z. So our first group has the presentation X, and our second group has the presentation Y. We're just going to use two different letters. Uh, this is a little bit reminiscent for the coproduct for topological spaces. Remember how the coproduct works in topological spaces. For topological spaces, the coproduct is like the disjoint union. You have two sets that are disjoint, and then you take the union together. So this is somewhat similar. It's kind of like a disjoint union, so you kind of want to use two different symbols to describe, even though it's the exact same group. Uh, you, you can say this Z is isomorphic to this group, this one is isomorphic to that group. You're using two different symbols to help distinguish between these two groups. And the way you find the coproduct is uh, to find the presentation for the coproduct it is just like the product, except you do not include the commutative relations. 
i.e. the co-product is free from any additional relations. The only relations that it has are the ones that are forced by the original groups. That's the reason why the co-product that's the reason why the co-product is sometimes called the free product. So, so to show you how this works is the co-product between these two groups, the way you would find it is you would say, you would, this is what you do. You just take these two, you put them together. And for the relation, there is no relation. There's nothing that goes there. Unlike the product where you have to force the commutative relation, in the co-product, you do not force the commutative relation. You just write this. So it's just that. And what is this? This is the free group. This is the free group of rank of rank two. So the co-product is very different from the product. So the co we, uh, the product of these two groups was Z Cartesian product Z, whereas the co-product is something that's a lot larger than that. It, it's a lot more complicated than that because there's no commutative relationship that exists between X and Y. So that would be the co-product. So that's the way you find the co-product. Uh, let me show you another example. Let's find the co-product between, let's say, between Z mod 2 Z, so integers mod 2, and integers mod 3. So then we would uh, find the group presentation for integers mod 2, x, x squared is 1. And then we will find the group presentation for this one. So that would be y with y cubed is equal to 1. And then the way we find the group presentation for the coproduct is we write down, we copy and paste. It's just like a disjoint union. You just copy and paste the relations in the generator. So you would just say it's these two with the relation that x squared is 1 and y cubed is 1. Notice it's free from any additional relations. So those are the only relations that it has. Those are the only relations that are being satisfied. So that's how you find the coproduct between integers mod 2 and integers mod 3. You just, uh, on the level of, so in general, it's difficult to find the coproduct. But if you're using generators and relations, it's very easy to describe the coproduct. You just copy and paste the generators and relations. OK. And there's uh, one more thing that I want to talk about, one last thing I want to mention. And this is really what we care. So this is probably going to be the most important stuff and the upcoming uh, topic will be the most used one from combinatorial group theory. Why did we just not mention it first, you might ask? Well, because if I just mentioned it first without mentioning the other stuff, it would have been a lot more confusing. Fortunately, uh, it does not require that much discussion. It's very similar to what we've said already before. But I want to make the following definition. Let me start with this definition. So let G1, G2, G3 be three groups. And we have a homomorphism, let's say, from G1 to G2. And we have another homomorphism from G1 to G3. Let's call it G, the homomorphisms. We have three homomorphisms. So the fibered product, the fibered product, which is denoted by G1, G2, then you put this multiplication, and then you put G3 down here. Actually, I messed this up. Let me, let me start again. This is going to be G2 times G3 subscript g1 so the picture is this this is g2 g3 this is g1 and that's g so the fiber product which is denoted by this is a group let's call it p for product or fiber product such that we have projection maps, let's call it pi 1, or maybe we should call it pi 2, from P to G2, 
and pi 3 from P to G3, which makes the diagram commute, which makes the diagram commute and is universal. So all that means is the fibered product, it's similar to a product, but now these two have maps going into G1. So the fibered product is going to be some group, we call it F, which projects, we call this pi 2, 2, call this pi 3. So F projects to pi 2, it projects to pi 3. It makes the diagram commute. So going like this and going like this is the same thing. And it's universal in the following sense. So if you have any other group, let's call it G, and if you have a pair of mappings, a pair of homomorphisms from G to these two groups that also makes the diagram commute, then there exists a unique mapping from G to F, a unique mapping that will complete the diagram and make it commute. So this universal, this optimal group that satisfies all of that for you is referred to as a fibered product, a fibered product. So this is actually, this is very important in algebraic geometry. But in algebraic geometry, you work with these things called schemes. And you have this thing called the fibered product for schemes, which is used a lot in algebraic geometry. In topology, well, I should say in, in group theory, in topology, in what we're going to be doing, I should say the type of group theory we're going to be using in topology, we're going to use something else. We're going to use, instead of using the fibered product, we're going to use the fibered co-product. That's what we're going to use. And you can probably guess how it's going to be defined. Now, before I say anything, this is what I want to mention. You're going to have a homework exercise uh, to, construct, to construct a fibered product and show it exists. I think that would be a great homework exercise to actually come up with the construction of the fiber product that has all of those properties for you. And then I will also let you think and think about how to compute, how to compute, how to compute the fiber product using group um, presentations. So uh, that would be like a good homework exercise. So I'm going to give you some groups, some presentations, and then you'll have to figure out what the, what the presentation, the group presentation is for the fiber product. So it's very similar to what we've talked about, but there's that extra level because there's that one extra group that's being involved. Uh, so that's what we call the fibered product. So I mentioned this because in some areas of math, you work with the fibered product, namely in algebraic geometry. But we're going to be working instead, and this is what we really want to get to at the end of this discussion, is we want to get to something called a fibered co-product. So here's the, so this is, I would say, th this is going to be the most used technique that we're going to do from uh, combinatorial group theory. So let G1, G2, G3 be three groups. And now the picture is going to go very different. We're going to define what it means. We're going to instead define something. It's going to go the other way. Let's, let's just write it like this. And we're going to have a map. We're going to have a map. Uh, I think I actually, so I just realized something. I realized that I wrote my arrows going like this, but here they were projections. So I written it correctly in the picture, but I written the arrows going backwards. So that would mean that I have to change the picture. So, okay, so here's the way the picture is going to go. This is, so this is going to be F, that is going to be G, it's going to be F and G. And then this is going to go from G1 to G2, from G1 to G2. This is F from G1 to G3, that's going to be G. So these are homomorphisms, we're just reversing the picture. And the fibered co-product, the fibered co-product, which is denoted, I'm not even sure how it's denoted. So let's let's not let's just call it, let's just call it C for co-product. The fibered co-product, let's just call it C, is a group C such that we have a pair, so instead of calling them projection maps, we usually call them inclusion maps. Not that it really matters what you call them. I, let's call it I2, G2 into C, and I3, G3 
into C, which makes the diagram commute and is, and is universal. So we can find this thing called C for which we have mappings. Let's call it I2 and I3 so that the diagram commutes this and this and this and this commute. And this is universal in the sense that if you have any other group for which you have two additional maps so that this commutes with this, then there exists a unique mapping. Then there exists a unique mapping out of the coproduct, the coproduct, yeah, the co the fiber coproduct that makes this diagram commute. So that is, yeah, which makes this diagram commute. So we call that the fiber coproduct. Um, the additional name for this, that some people have a name for this, this is also called the push-out. Push-out. It's also called the push-out. So the, uh, the way the picture goes is you have G1, you have G2, you have G3. Okay, you have this kind of picture, and you're creating something called the push-out or the fiber co-product. You're pushing out the diagram further. You're pushing out for it further. That makes it commute, and it's universal. Uh, in the fiber product, it's kind of like a push in, but it's not. It's not called a push in. I, I checked if there's a terminology called a push in. It just goes the other way. It, it's you're just saying that if you have a diagram like that, you can put something on top. This is the fiber product that projects to those two, and it fits in here in a universal way. So this is called the push out. You're pushing everything out. And this is the fiber product. I, I would call it the push in, but then I'm just making up words that no one else uses. OK, so how do we compute the push out? So let me explain to you how to compute the push out. So how do we compute the push out from a group presentation? Let me give you an example. So let's say we have the group of integers down here. And we map the group of integers in here by a mapping. And this mapping, I'm going to call it times 2, the times 2 mapping. All what this means is, is that every element in x gets doubled. right? It becomes 2x. x is being sent to 2x. You're doubling the integer. right? That's a homomorphism. The doubling map is a homomorphism. So this is a homomorphism. And then let's say we have another homomorphism. And let's say we use the tripling map. Okay, this is the tripling map. So every integer is being sent to the triple of itself. So that's also a group homomorphism. So we have two group homomorphisms, and we want to find the push out. We want to take this diagram and we want to be able to push it out further. And we want to, and let's say P is a push out. And the problem is this. The problem is to describe P, the pushout, as a group presentation. You want to be able to describe the pushout using generators and relations. So here's how you do it. You first begin by describing all three of these using generators and relations. So this one, using generators and relations, this would just be x. It's, it's just x, right? That there's nothing else here. That's just x. This would just be y, okay? And this one is just z. Okay, so it, it's just that for now. Now, the way you get the the way you get the push out is you look if you look at this piece, if you just look at the upper part of the push out, that should look like so this resembles so this resembles a coproduct. Right, it's sort of like a coproduct of these two. And in fact, a pushout is a fibered coproduct. It's a coproduct with one extra level at the bottom. There's an extra level to it. So you 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 begin calculating it just like you do with the you calculate it just like you do it with the coproduct. How would you find the coproduct? The way you would find the coproduct is you would just copy and paste the generators. So you would write x comma y, and then you write down the relations. So you have no additional relations, and then you would stop. So if this was just a coproduct, then this is all you would write. However, this is not just a coproduct. It has this thing down here. And what is the requirement that we have to satisfy? The requirement that we have to satisfy is this generator. When we map it, so when we map it in here, and then that gets mapped in there, has to agree 
with the way that generator gets mapped in here. So let's figure out how that works. So if we let's so let me remove this because this is going to get confusing. So what's the um, what is this map doing? It's taking Z, the generator. This is basically like the number one, right? What's the generator for, for Z? It's the number one. And where is one being sent to? Well, it's being doubled. It's being doubled. So it's being, it's being sent to the number two. But the number two in this group using this generator, so this plays the role of X, that's basically X squared. That's what it is. That, that becomes X squared. Uh, and this one, it sends one, it multiplies it by three, so it sends it to three. So the way you get three over here is by writing it as y cubed. So in you want, because you want this composition to agree with that composition, you better have that this one and this one agree together. So these two have to be set equal to each other. And so the group presentation, the way you would write it is, you would say the push out, the way you present it as a, as a group, it will consist of two generators, x and y, that have the additional relation that x squared is equal to y cubed. So that would be the relation that they have to satisfy. Because that's that you need that because when you if you think of this as the inclusion, if you just think of that as the inclusion, you're basically saying that this x squared is being included in P and this y cubed is being included in P. And this arrow and these two arrows, they have to coincide and they have to give you the same thing. So you have to therefore set them equal to each other. So P as a group presentation will it will have two generators that satisfy that uh, requirement. So let's actually perhaps summarize how to compute a co-product, a, a push-out. So let us summarize how to compute the push-out or fiber co-product, if you prefer to use that terminology. So if we have two groups, so let's say we have a group down here that has a bunch of generators. Let's call it, so I, we have a group here. It has generators, a list of xi, and some relations ri. And then we have a group over here whose uh, generators are called, let's say, yj, and whose relations are, let's call them tj. So tj are the, are the words that are being set equal to 1. Okay, So these are the letters, and these are the words that are being set equal to 1. Those are the relations. And the group at the bottom of the fibered coproduct, let's say its generators are zk, and the relations, let's give them a name. Let's say they're called UK. And the way you get the coproduct, so the way you would get it is, this is the way it would go. You would copy these together. You would have XI comma YJ. You would put all of those together. You copy over the relations that you have before. And then, so you have, you have a function over here, F, and you have a function over here, G, right? This is being mapped. So you're going to apply F to each of those. So you're going to have F of ZK being set equal to, being set equal to G of ZK. So that's what you would, you would put in there. Um, so those two have to be equal Those two have to be equal. And furthermore, right, so F applied to ZK, it ends up over here. And G applied to ZK, it ends up over there. And whatever they end up, they have to be the same in the, in the co-product. So therefore, you set them equal to each other. And then furthermore, each of these UKs, right, each of these UKs, each of these words are being mapped where? They're being mapped by F. So F of UK also has to be set equal to 0. So F applied to UK has to, I'm sorry, being set equal to one. And then you have, which I'll just write like this, right? That means set equal to one. And then G of UK. So that's the way you do it. You kind of put all of those relations together. So that is how you find the push out. Now, maybe you find all of this stuff quite abstract and it's not perfectly clear how this is being used and how this is being used in topology. Uh, and that's okay. It's okay if this stuff does not perfectly make sense because that's not the intent of the course. The intent of the course is to do topology. However, to do topology, you need to understand some of this stuff. So if you find this stuff confusing, you will probably find it less confusing when we use it again in the calculation of the fundamental group. And then it will start to make more sense of what's going on. 
So we'll stop here, and next time we'll continue and we'll discuss how you solve the word problem for commutative groups. So for commutative groups, there's a method for solving the word problem. That's what we're going to discuss.